today I only do a late and short stream because I was fighting some major pollen allergy problems the whole day. <clears throat> but let's do some um, let's do some useful and and re relatively simple stuff. In the previous two streams. Uh, we built up our own unit test framework to replace the horrible bloat that is Google test. And we got so far in a day yesterday that uh, I could convert my first actual unit test file to use the new framework and it works. And today I want to do what is necessary to convert all the rest. The rest uses a bit more features than this, this one single file. But first, <clears throat> as a warm up, I want to clean up some things that um, clean up some things that I did not left, uh, leave in a good shape uh, yesterday. So let's start with that. The first thing is the uh, colorful printing that, it, that I really enjoy a lot but that needs to be a bit cleaned up. So how it works currently is that we have a test fprintf function. It works exactly like fprintf just has an additional argument, this test context, and it takes some special markup codes that we can use to color our output. And I want to clean up those marker codes and their parsing. So because that's currently implemented in a very stupid way. If we look at the, the function, you see that it has some very inelegant if else chain uh, with a lot of redundancy uh, checking the codes. And I also found that uh, the codes, the codes then themselves are not well designed currently. Uh, one thing is that they use braces as an escape character and I actually use braces quite a lot in my prints. So I do not want to use them for escaping. Let's do something else. Also, <clears throat> I want to simplify the code a bit because previously I made this uh, test printer function. I renamed it now that that takes an integer attribute and this is another level of indirection that is actually quite useless here because it turns out that, that this function that with this integer attribute, <coughs> I do not, I practically do not use this and this will become an implementation detail. So let's start. We will remove the, the attribute definitions here. These will go away then test print of attribute will become an implementation detail. So let's move that to the imper name, name space. So this should be the closing brace of the imper name space. Yeah. And let's actually Uh, let us actually simplify this by passing in the attributes directly here. So we will actually say that uh, this is simply the lower 16 bits of attribute, attribute. so we do not need this nonsense. Um, what I also, I think, will do is if the attributes match what, what is already set in the console, then we won't do the, the setting at all. So we, won't, we only do the attribute setting if the attributes are not equal to what we have currently set. And same for the resetting afterwards, because here we do the attribute resetting 
and this actually only needs to be done if okay we can let's move this outside let's move this here uh, where do we do we use the VA list the first time we will move this here <coughs> and only if we have the if we have different attributes we will actually reset this uh, something that I did off stream so I didn't do a lot off stream today just a little cleanup um, what I did is if we don't have a console we just skip the uh, skip the coloring and actually that was already in place yesterday but what I did is I detect whether we have a console or not so if we pipe output to a file um, we just don't do the coloring <coughs> actually as it is implemented on Windows we even could do these API calls they, they don't hurt but uh, as long as we as long as we wouldn't care about errors, we could do them, but uh, it's cleaner not to do them if, if we don't need them. Okay, so that was the first thing. So let's get rid of all of the calls to this function, except the one that is used internally here. So this now goes to imper namespace. So this, for example, will become just a simple call without the attribute. Yeah, that's it. The next step is to to refactor the markup codes, and what I want to do is instead of this uh, brace red brace I thought what is the SC character that I use less often in my printouts and I think it's definitely the dollar sign so I, I, I never use the dollar sign in any of my of my printing and we will build in an escape mechanism for if we actually want to print the dollar sign we will just double it and that's it um, I also want to use single letters for the colors like R for red and then I think a colon to end the escape sequence and makes it also more readable if the R is before a word for example in the string so that will be our, our syntax for now it's not as readable but I think it will be much easier to extend and, and much cleaner so same goes because then we can also add intensity and background colors and things like that and single letters are much easier to parse so this will be the same for green blue cyan um, and the empty code will just be this okay do we use some of these codes here yes so we should also do a replacement here I think those are the only ones actually yeah the these these markers will definitely be refactored later to to do less in the marker and more in a, a function they call so let's go to test f print f and let's refactor the handling here so we do not need such huge variables here 32 bit is more than enough actually we only need 16 but whatever um yeah so 
let's so if we have a a dollar the escaping we will implement a bit differently so if we have a dollar mark end of the substring before the dollar so here we actually replace the dollar with the null character to end the string we can do this because we are working here in a buffer that we just before we created ourselves the empty formatting code here will become this Actually, I think we do not we do not use the end pointer at all, so we can clean that up. So start of a formatting code. Yeah, we now do the cleanup. So let's just get the next the next character. Uh, the question is, what do we do if we are hitting already the terminating zero so that the formatting code is incomplete? Do we, do we accept that or do we just ignore it? Do we then just print the dollar? Maybe it's, maybe it's best in this case I mean, we could error out, that would be one option. We could treat it as an empty formatting string, or we could just print the dollar. I think we will print the dollar. So actually, let's do this special handling only if the number of characters left is positive, left after. So number of, this is the number of characters uh, left after the, the dollar. And here actually we can simplify this because this is a bit confusing, this plus two. The plus two is because I added two, two characters here. We will just do this by doing this that is easier to understand. We just add characters at the end. And we will also explain here, so adding one for terminating null and two for, um, for the empty formatting code we append below so that I always if I have magical numbers like this plus one plus two I always like to explain why they are there so I never forget and remove them and create a problem or something so yeah the plus one here is fine but here we actually add characters and so this calculation becomes much more simpler um, so I think we do not even, and uh, maybe we, let's, number of characters left after, after the dollar. Let's just be very explicit about what this is. <clears throat> so if we have something left at all, so we, we know in this case that we have not we have not hit the terminating zero, so this we can assert here. And now, if the character is just another dollar, then we just handle it like any other character. Oh, this we actually must do. 
already here before replacing it with the null. Wait. No, no. No, I'm wrong. So in this case, we need to print the thing before and then we need to print the dollar. Let's handle this as the last thing because it's, it's not difficult to handle, but to handle it cleanly, we, it will be clearer when we have the structure of the rest of the code, how to do it. Because now I actually want to parse a variable number of characters. And we will say, let's say while while character is not the, the colon, which is our terminating character. <clears throat> and also we could run in the later iteration, we could run into the end of the string which we maybe just accept as an end of the formatting code. So so let's do it like this. While we have a character and it is not the colon. So, no need to redeclare really this here. And let's do a switch over the character. And then we, um, we basically built up the attributes. So first let's clear the next attribute. Maybe we will actually move this inside here. Mm, let's see. If we have, for example, R, this means that We have a foreground red to add. And actually we will, by default, I think we will have foreground intensity set. Oh no, not by the default, because we want the empty code to be exactly zero. So these will, this will set foreground intensity by default because that's usually what we want. And then we will have something for removing the intensity. So what, what do we want to have? Red, green, green, blue are the basics. Then we have cyan, magenta, A yellow, um, these are the ones with two components set. Uh, then we have white with all three components set and we have black, which we will take K for, which has zero components set. And actually, what I probably want to do here is to just replace the color part. So what we will actually do is
and make a mask for foreground. And what we will actually do here We will remove all the foreground bits and then add some with the intensity. Let's see how we will handle this. So actually for black, for black we don't we don't add anything. That's actually interesting because hmm. I'm not that sure how to design this in the most nice way because actually the intense black is pro probably the dark gray. And I don't know if I want K for that. Maybe it's fine. I'm not sure. Uh, we also could encode the intensity by, by uppercase and lowercase. Thinking about that. I actually wanted to use uppercase for background. But maybe we just use the second letter for background. That, that would be an option. Hmm. <laughs> I'm a bit undecided on that. Yeah, let's do something and let's see how we like it. So this is green, blue. So then we have the ones with two, so cyan has green and blue. Magenta has red and blue. Yellow has red and green. And white has all four. So that has actually the whole foreground mask, actually, if we want to do it like that. We can get rid of all of this nonsense. We should probably have the default for unknown formatting code. We can actually tell which, which character it is. Um, but what I usually don't like, I don't like to print characters like these. Because they can be non-printable characters and so Let's print it. Let's print its character value as a number that's a safe saver. So we have an error here, so we should actually do an, an exit. Better be strict in this testing stuff. So that's it so far. We print the text so far with the old attribute and then we set the next attribute. Okay.
actually if we find if we find the second dollar we could just replace the second dollar instead of the first one with a zero and just print the stuff that's maybe the easiest thing to do so we get the next character here which we know is is non-zero um, if this character is another dollar we have the case of an escape literal dollar so what we do is we replace this one with a null with a null Uh, then print. And in this case, next attribute is just the same as attribute. And we do the rest only otherwise. So we only accept that this, the duplicated dollar is the first thing in the code. That should be fine. <clears throat> yeah. Let's see if this does anything useful so far. Oh, I'm starting the wrong file, but let's anyway. Yeah, it's working. It's just printing too many dollars. That's it. That should not happen. By the way, I, I don't know why I have this test failure. Failure. I need to investigate. It seems to be a, an, a genuine test failure, not not a bad one because we have a least something like the least significant bit in a floating point number deviating. So you see that I'm parsing this crazy floating point number with my PDF parser routines. I'm really stressing them, and there is one in the round trip from um, in the round trip from how is it from double to text representation to double there is one least significant bit difference this is something i need to investigate uh, at another time so it seems really to be a test failure that is correctly reported by a framework okay um why do we print too many dollars even though we replace ah this now okay this is because we actually need to replace the minus two and here we need to replace the minus one because we already incremented because we consumed We already consumed the second character. <clears throat> yeah, now it's looking fine again. Okay, the yellow is still there. This needs to change. So yellow is now dollar white colon. Okay, now it works. Um, yeah, I should not run this slow test. That's something else. Next thing we will do is to check if the dollar escape works. I 
I'm not sure how to handle the intensity stuff and the background stuff. I mean, probably I can reuse the same letters for background. Because it doesn't make sense to have multiple colors. Yeah, so this works. Um, let's run a different file, the faster one, test, test. And let's let somewhere print a print a dollar. Ah, I see a potential problem. If we end the string in a dollar, we will add another dollar and a colon, and then we will get the colon at the end. So that's not that's not nice. We need to fix that. Yeah. So okay, we get even get unknown formatting code. It was with dollar dollar. Why do we get unknown formatting code? The 5D, is that the dollar? Which one do I always use? This one, I think. Um, five D is actually the closing bracket. Huh? Ah, because that's the next one we get. Yeah, so we have dollar bracket actually. So that's why that's so it's actually let's improve our reporting on because I really shouldn't need an SC table to look up that. How we can we do this in a better way? Um, let's do it like this. Uh, let's make ourselves a little a little buffer. Doesn't really matter because this is not speed sensitive code here, but um, it just cannot. Actually, we can do it inside here. If we put. Uh, so <clears throat> the. This will be our buffer. And We have a second buffer. That will be this. There we will put the character and
and here we will say if character is a printable character then we will use the show jar buffer otherwise the hex jar So let's see if that works. I always want to have nice error messages. They save so much time. Yeah, that's much nicer. Unknown formatting code closing bracket. That makes it much clearer. And let's see if it works with a non-printable character. Uh, let us put a tab here after the We should get a nine hexadecimal. Yeah, nice. I don't form it to code nine. That is good. So this is fine. But what if we actually at the end print the dollar, then it will add another dollar and a colon. So that will not be so nice. So here we get the dollar. Here we get the dollar. I would have expected that we also get the colon. But this is something that, that we do not really want. Let's first check if the normal dollar escape works. Yeah. Normal dollar escape is working, that's fine. So if we have the dollar at the end, Then we add another dollar and then the colon. So I would normally expect the colon to be printed. A dollar, an unescaped dollar and the colon. First it is a dollar, then it consumes the next dollar. It's the next dollar. This becomes a zero. <clears throat> we should now be at the colon next attribute. And start should be set as the colon. Ah, we don't, yeah, we don't print it because we do not special case the end of the string because the purpose of adding the empty code below, uh, above here is that we do not need to special case the end printing. So this case actually works out fine. It works out fine. So I think we will just accept this behavior and make a note here. The last character of the both is uh,
I think that's that's acceptable behavior. So let's let's note this down. This is fine, and I think everything works. But let's now change this from a loop We actually don't need to loop here. So first character. For first character, we will decode foreground colors. And now we will actually encode, we will encode the intensity. And I think we will also also allow to switch intensity on and off. So the next attribute will default to what we currently have. Which means we should actually query the we should query the next attribute the attribute here. To be cleaner. So let's do that. <clears throat> let's query the current attribute. And no need to flush here. This is something we let's make a note. Because we have this so often that we print uh, the Windows error and then exit that I think we should refactor this into a sing single helper to make our code more compact. So we get this and then we will say we start out with the attributes here, but let's zero them first. If we don't have a console handle, they, they will just be zero. So we will always have start out with the right attribute. So so k k should actually It's just what, I, what I'm not sure is yeah let's just let's just see I, I'm always about such little dis design details I'm always a bit uncertain because I really want to have my things logical and nicely designed always even if it's just about such a tiny thing I just want to enjoy using my code. So let's because what I'm thinking now, do I want to I want to be able to switch the intensity without switching other things. I think I want that. So I want something like plus to turn on the intensity. So here we here we would just add foreground intensity with minus we would 
we would uh, take away the foreground intensity and let's say with a dot we just leave the, the foreground attributes unchanged if we only want to change the background. And then the question is, do we want to have the possibility to switch the color without, without changing the intensity? It probably does not make a lot of sense because the colors look so different with the different intensity. So my first idea would be to add intensity to the foreground mask. So we remove it here. For K we actually then have zero for the foreground bits. And these would actually then be the uppercase I guess I have to use the uppercase for the more intense ones because otherwise it's just not logical. So we would have the, the bright black would be that and then we would have the same ones the lowercase ones it would be without the intensity flag Oh, there's something wrong. This should be green, green and blue. Cyan. Green, blue, why? I deleted the wrong one here. Red, blue, red, green. And this one actually here we need to do the same thing. Let's let's just add red, green, blue. So, let's then actually we will see if I actually understand the attributes correctly. We should have 16. Yeah, those are 16. What we cannot do currently is change, we cannot change the color without actually prescribing also the intensity. We could make extra codes for that later if we ever need that. But that's, I don't think this would be a typical case. Um, first character unknown or unrecognized let's say unrecognized first character because we will have others too 
So that's the handling of the foreground. Let's get another character. Actually, we also should handle the colon here. That's the empty code. And in this case, we should say We should set an end flag or something. If we did not get the end flag, we will pass the, we will check the second character. This could not be could not be a zero. So here we know the first character is for sure not a zero. And now this we know from above. But here it could not it could not be. So we this is a case we need to handle. So here we have the case again of the of the colon. We will also treat null. We we'll also treat null as a as an end of the formatting code, and that's what we treat so far, I think. Why do we have indentation problems here? Because we did not close this one. Let's see if this, okay, uh, yeah, let's see if this works. You now have the non bright colors, I guess. What is it doing? Oh, I have again. This is something because I have this thing where I do I do this always on top for the chat window and sometimes sometimes this gets somehow this hits the other windows and then I get strange window behavior. Yeah, now we have the dim colors. Uh, so let's replace, let's see, um, is there some Vim magic for doing uppercase? Yeah, next character made uppercase. So it can do it, I think. So let's substitute a dollar. And then one of the characters, let's say A to C, actually A to C, the small ones. Uh, we capture this and this will be replaced to uppercase one. Let's see if this works. Yeah, it works. Oh, Vim is so great. Isn't Vim the greatest people? 
it is the greatest. It is simply the greatest. Now we have bright colors again. And let's actually remove this spurious dollar sign that we added for testing. Did we add it for test? Yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, this is working. So let's try some other. Sorry, I'm hitting the microphone. Let's try some other colors. Let's have some fun with colors. Let's try the bright black because who does not like a bright black? It's nice, ah, but it's bleeding over. Why is it bleeding over? Why is the dark gray bleeding over? That's not right. Ah, because I, I think I did not implement the colon correctly. Because Hmm. That is now a bit difficult because what the colon actually means is reset. Reset to what it was before. So we have a kind of so these, these codes, they do, kind of a push of attributes onto a stack. And the colon pops from this stack. Do we want that? I mean, we could also say the colon is a hard reset. A hard reset to attribute zero or something. I mean, the, the, the simplest thing here would be that it's always a reset to what the attributes were at the beginning of the printing. The question is, if we implement it as a stack of attributes, uh, do we want do we want to work that stack to work across multiple invocations of the print function because then we would have to put it into the context structure and we would need to make it variable size if we say it should only work within a single print statement and we do not allow bleeding over of formats into other print statements then we could implement the stack directly in the buffer. Hmm. <laughs> we could keep keep the decision for later and say that the colon the colon is kind of a hard reset and there's a different character which does the popping from a from an attribute stack. The question is what is the default attribute? Is this is it just zero?
I'm also not sure what about these. These. DBCS, what is that? DBCS. Double, okay, double byte character set. Let's do the simple thing first. So let's actually say that column, if it's the first character, the column, um, we actually reset the attributes to what they were at the beginning. No, it's so weird. So many little design decisions. But I think as long as we, yeah, now the bleeding over is stopped. As long as we keep things extendable extensible how do I say it's fine but for having fun let us add some background codes so here the colon okay this is actually does not reset only the first one so Let's do the background stuff. This is gone. Yeah, we can also, the, the dot will always be a no op. I wonder if the space is a better no op. But it, it visually that uh, they should. Visually, the space would seem to separate things, so that's not maybe not so good. Idea. Yeah, so that's fine. We all the foreground will be replaced by background here. Here, okay, this is not so nice that we repeat this. And it's also not the worst thing in the world. So that would be our background handling. Okay, there's the there's something funky with yeah, this is <coughs> Okay, but now we have to deal with a third character potentially. Uh, do we have the zero? Yeah, we have the zero treated. Third potential third character. There we will not do a lot correctly. Currently, uh, 
We'll redo the zero and the column. Yeah, this is something now I really am. Let's make a helper for this. This is ugly to have this. Um, Actually, not only print, we will do a knowing format code error. So what do we need? We have character pointing to the whole code. Uh, which character it is? And then we have the actual character, and this will do this stuff. Unrecognized which character in formatting code code. Now we can clean this up. The first one in P, which is this one. Yeah, better, much better. So let's see if it still works and then let's try some to have some fun with background colors. Of course it is an impel. Otherwise this is a look of did I not put it in a namespace? I meant to put it in namespace impel. Okay, it's still working. And now let's color things. Um, so we could do, let's try some white on dark blue, for example. Okay, the white worked, but the blue didn't. The white white worked. So we shouldn't have an end here, right? End is false. So here we get the Y. Next I do it for one last break. Then it's not at an end. We take the next one. Blue. Why did this not work? Next attribute. Let's debug print. Let's debug print the attributes.
Now it works. Did I just not see it before? Because I see, I see blue. I think it's just on my screen, it's really hard to see the blue. There's only a few pixels and it's not very bright. Did it work before already? Maybe I just missed the blue color. Yeah, I think that's what, what's happened. Let's um, let's try to use a large font. Yeah, it's clearly it is clearly white on blue. Let's make the non-bright white to be a bit nostalgic. Nice. Let's do white on bright red, which is which I never would use for OK, which is one of my favorite error combinations. Nice, this is all working. So let's just try the intensity stuff. Increase the intensity for one. Okay, this also works. Nice, I think everything is working. Actually what we want here is the bright green. And I'm actually thinking about making the running nodes non-bright. Let's see how this looks like. I think I like that. Nice, I think that's a win. That's a win for the first thing we want to do. Uh, the next thing I wanted to do is test fixtures. And it's about the following that it's a feature of Google test and many other frameworks that is or can be quite useful and I'm currently using it in some of my important unit tests. I have a fixture test randomized with memory that does a setup of randomization of the test and, and a memory manager. And then I have tests that use this fixture. And the point is that, so first there's a setup and teardown that is done before and after the test that is coded in a fixture. And the second thing is, which is actually quite handy, that this test will then actually be implemented as a member function of a derive, of a class derived from the fixture. And that means that data members of the fixture are, <coughs> sorry, are available in the test which is rather useful. So for example, you see here we use the mem <coughs> pointer to the memory manager. And this is something that comes from the fixture. And that's quite convenient because you do not need any, if you often use the same stuff, uh, you can just put it in a fixture and makes the tests more compact. So let's try something like that. We need to implement this test F Marco magic.
so let's replace suit name by fixture name to be more clear about the intent here. <clears throat> and now the question is, okay, now we really must have a class which for me will be a struct because I don't use class because I don't want private and so on. Um, so test fixture, let's call it fixture name. It will actually not, oh, it will, yeah, it will also have the test name because for every test we will make a new derived class. And this will be derived from the fixture name class. This class will have a member function. This will actually be our test function. <clears throat> that will be our test function. Oh no, it will not, not quite because the test the test also has to actually create create the fixture. So this will then be our test member test member function. Should we put Okay, the registrar, the registrar we the registrar we put in the namespace. The actual test function will be something that we define here in the macro. Um, and this will instantiate the fixture, I think. It will instantiate the fixture. It will call fixture setup. But then it will call fixture and then the test number function on the fixture. Um, giving it the test context. Which we will all also pass to the constructor of the fixture, I guess. Do I want a constructor or do I just want a setup? Why am I making this in an object-oriented style? The reason is I want to have this automatic me member variable, member, member data members available in the test function. And still, I don't know whether I want to use a constructor or whether I just want to pass the context to the setup function. I mean, which you can do anyway. And just default construct a fixture. And say, if you need the context for anything, you must do it in the setup in the tab or in it. Because I don't like constructors and destructors anyway. So that is the definition of the test function. And now, 
comes the actual definition of the member function. Test member function. So actually this is void. And this is then what is actually then the, the user code comes afterwards and defines this. Question is also, should we put this also in an, in an, an anonymous namespace like the registrar? I don't know. I mean, it's not something that we want to export to other code, right? Don't want to have this public, so it's probably cleaner to put it all in the anonymous namespace, I guess. The test function itself we cannot put in the namespace because then at the end we would need a closing brace that doesn't work. Okay, here we will actually have a problem. because we don't have the prototype for the test function as we have it here, but we could actually, I think we could actually put the whole test function inside the anonymous namespace, because why not? This does not need to be public. Here we can do it, above we cannot do it. Maybe, maybe then it's a bad idea that we do it differently. Yeah, I think we shouldn't do it differently. That would be very confusing if you try to hunt down a problem with this stuff. So the test functions will always be outside, basically, basically public. The fixture and the re registrar will be anonymous. Yeah, that could work if we had a working fixture. But that's the responsibility of our test utility code. Test randomized with memory. Currently don't have this at all, but we will Reinstantiate this. We don't need to derive this from something special. We don't need any listener or crappy things like that. We don't need the signal handler. Then we also don't need this this will not be an override in this case i mean maybe we should have a base class just to make sure that the, that the override works and so on i don't know so this is also already getting a bit simpler than it was before okay this is still, this was still scan. I mean, this is something we can in the end remove. This, this is something we will still need to test seed stuff. But this will go directly into our test main, I think. So we have to test 
kann ich hier machen mit Teardown. No longer single handler stuff. No longer listen. We don't. We don't need a listener anymore. We will have some other much simpler way, I think, to to make the report that we want to do of the seed. But probably we move this directly into our own framework because we probably use it a lot. It's no longer needed. Yeah, this is something that will actually work just fine, I think. And actually, for us, this will always, this will be always fatal. Which I think is actually nicer than in in Boost. Uh, in sorry, in, in in Google Test. Because our rule is, we always have the test context, and then we can also do this sort here. Um, Also here, it's always nice to have some explicit context. What we definitely will no longer need is the signal handler here. Mm, okay, report memory error. Here we do some dependency injection for reporting memory manager errors. Um, this is something... Here we will, I think we will actually... We will actually add the test context. And then this is completely fine because then we can do an assert, assert true false, but we will actually later want to have some nicer way to report a, a meaningful error message here. I mean, for now, something that we can do Yeah, this is a case where we definitely would like to would like to have the attributes working across the function calls because then we would, could easily print something colorful here for now we can just do something like this test context i also need to think about the handles how i want to do this. So let's formal let's format this white on red, for example, and let's say
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now this is something we need to do in memory. Is that the this report function and also the shell in check they they take an opaque pointer as all callbacks should i so far didn't do it because we have the memory pointer anyway but it would be a pain to to actually modify or, or derive something from a, derive a class from memory in order to add some data so we will have opaque pointers here and whenever we call it Isn't Vim great? Yeah, the forward injection, this is something that is only, I mean, it's basically there. It's just we need a nicer way to use it in tests. I'm not sure if I covered everything now. Um, I did update the function type, the default handler. Ah, I need one more. This one needs the opaque pointer. And this one will need a cast because either that Always say here this is opaque and do the cast explicitly inside. Okay, so for sure I missed things, I guess. Do we need test here? Yeah, this is also something that will go away. I mean, maybe, I think it will go away. We might still differentiate between test util and test, so make test a very generic framework that we can could maybe also um, publish as, as uh, free software, for example, and keep our test util more specific to the application. And then we might have something, a main function here that I think here we need the test.h probably do we really call my send twist yeah we need okay yeah we call this here 
Yeah, so for sure this will not compile yet. This would be the greatest miracle if this would compile. So of course it doesn't compile. Of course this needs to be a void pointer and this also needs to be a void pointer. What did I think? I think this is nothing. So, of course, it is still not compile. Oh, yeah, we probably don't have updated this in the header. The these now take the test context pointer. And this means we either need a forward declaration here or we just need the header also here. Okay, it seems it seems we still get the Google test header somewhere. Do we have it here somewhere? Where do we get the G? Ah, it's probably in the unit test itself is still the G test. Yeah. Go away, G test. We don't want none of your business here. Test function, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we should, I'm just seeing that we actually don't add a separator between the names. We should probably do that, even though there is no real way to make it unique. If you have underscores in these things like I have here. That's why Google test says you shouldn't put underscores inside. But, okay, this one, I know what the other ones are, but this one, undeclared awaiting test function. That means something about the macro did not quite work, the macro. Test function is here as a prototype. Ah, it's because I have suit name here instead of fixture name. That was this problem. And the other one is clear. This is something we simply have to stupidly fix now. Wow, this will be quite a lot of work. Because we do not have the nice type magic of Google test. That's the one advantage that we have from the template stuff. And we could do some very simple template things here. The main problem is the printing. The printing is the main problem. <clears throat> we could maybe do some, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> uh, we could maybe do some very simple template stuff that does <clears throat> a 
that works for different integers and integers actually cover almost everything that we need. Because <clears throat> otherwise we have to change all these things, which I'm not looking forward to a lot. Could we do something template magically? How would that look like? It would look look something like that. Where do we put it? Maybe here. We would have something like template class T. Check equal. We would have to test context like always. And then we'd probably have a T actual and a T expected. Uh, we would have a file name and a a line number. And let's see how such a thing could work. The nice thing is here we just need the the equals operator. This will work for sure. <clears throat> and now the printing. We could say this this thing works only for stuff that has standard limits defined for it. Standard limits or what else is there? Is there okay? Why does this not work? Oh, it's called numeric limits, standard numeric limits. That is something that would be useful. What would be type traits? Type traits. Yeah, this <clears throat> this type trait stuff we could also use. We would even have fun things like is pointer. Two type or four is type. How does this work? I did not use this. Okay, this is an operator bool.
It's an integral constant. Okay, you can just use a value. <coughs> We have is pointer <coughs> and we have is integral. And then we just, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> and then we really just need the size and the signedness. And the signedness we also have here. And this could be good enough to get us almost all the way. So, how is this called? Type traits. Let's see if this works here. Should work something like this, right? Start this integral value. Um, and we will also do the pointer stuff, probably. <clears throat> and not that much else. And, and we will carefully check the generated code that comes out of this, if this is generates same code. And then we will do something very similar to this here. Oh, the size, yeah. So we know it's signed. Now the question is the size. So do we just use size of probably? If size of t is, let's do it like this, fits in a in 32 then, because we assume at least a 32-bit machine, now actually let's do this, if it is int, because then we have integer promotion and things are simple. Fail expected. We can use just integer, but it's actually integer so and so. Oh, the fatal we should also have. Yes. And this is file name and this is line. Okay, we could ha have ourselves passed some strings here which is probably a nice idea. So let's pass ourselves a actual string and a expected string from, sorry, from the Marco magic. 
file name line. So first we do the stringy stuff. Actual string should be expected string. Then we can actually print the expected value and the actual, uh, yeah, maybe we clean up the, we clean up the sequence afterwards. So we don't yet have the static assert, I think. Uh, when is the static assert introduced? Why does it not find it? I think there's a static assert now, right? Uh, but let's first do this. If it is, if it fits into an int 64t. I mean, maybe we should, I think we could always use this one. Because why not cast everything to 64 bits? It doesn't hurt. We know it is signed. We know it is integral. So, I mean, it should actually be. Not a huge problem, right? Because then we should generate a nice mes message here. So if you're not signed, we just do the same thing with you. Maybe we should do some hex also. I will add some hex later, maybe. That's often very useful. So, I'm curious if this will work and especially I'm curious if, if this will, um, if this will generate reasonable code I hope we won't run into the same horrible compile times like because if so I will just change everything to use explicit type macros. So let's do the template magic version. In this case, we do not need the format specified. Uh, we don't need any of that. What we do need is a test check equal. So 
so we need to test context the actual the expected the stringified versions file line fatal That's it. Mm, I think we wouldn't even need to do while here, but yeah, whatever. Lots of errors. Oh, yeah, this should be void, I guess. <coughs> should also be in line. Or is this maybe for template is not needed? Test check equal. Okay, does this actually? It doesn't find a matching because it could be uint or int. Ah, it, it does not know which way to decide. That's stupid. So we would have to make this here a, a uint64. And that's quite stupid because if we do that we can use the explicit macro anyway The problem is that means we would need to make the template take two types if we want it to work. And that creates a combinatoric problem. Let's see how that would look like. The problem is now which one to choose here and how to deal with the combinations. I mean, integral is rather easy because we would just assert the other is integral too. Should do this statically. That's not so bad. Signed is, is is already getting bad because we often have the currently we often have we sometimes have the actual first um, the actual first we should 
We should really decide by the, by the first one. <clears throat> Actually, if the other one is unsigned but is small enough, it's, it's not a problem. So if this is signed, we could do something like assert that the other is also signed or at least the size of, of the other is smaller than what we have here. Do something like this. If the first one is unsigned, the other should also be unsigned. Or at least, so if not standard is unsigned T2 value, or, or at least it should be positive, non negative, right? So, so the first one actually is unsigned then we should never have something signed here. I have no idea if this will have some reasonable outcome. Or if we will go to template La La Land more quickly than we think. <clears throat> yeah, we already have problems with some strange types. Yeah, we have problems with the enumerated types. Okay, where is this? Oh, where is the... Ah, because we now... I think this should be not test main, right? We have the problem with the enum types. Because the enum types do not have... Do not have the... This operator. I mean, for them, they actually should not be signed. So we wouldn't need that check here. We could simply cast them. We could cast them. Okay, something works actually. <laughs> That's so nice. We are running this test.
I'm just not sure about this template stuff. So how does it look like at this point? Where do we get the awards? So maybe we should have a better report here. But that's not too bad. So we're already running. I, I'm just not sure about what the template will do to our code quality, to our generated code quality. We really, really need to check that because that's dangerous. This is already far, far, far too magic here for my stuff here, uh, for, my, for my taste. But you see, I can do a bit of this stuff and I'm fully aware that this is for sure not the style that you would do in Boost with all, because you would do all the formatting with, with some template magic and that's completely crazy if you ask me because this then, it blows up so fast it's really a combinatoric problem. Um, <clears throat> anyway, C++ streams are a disaster anyway, so. That's not something I would use ever. So what problem do we have here? This, this one. So let's not make this an assertion. Let's actually print some error here. So we can, <clears throat> we know it is signed. We know we have this, actually let's do the size check first. Because if the things are too big, we don't know what to do with them really. If the things are too big, we don't know. So the sizes we can handle, we can handle sizes. So if we have a signedness problem between the two, if we really have a, a bad problem, we will get a warning from the company here, I think, if you really have a bad message, but... Um, so, we know that the first one is signed. The second one is unsigned. So let's just print it as unsigned. What is the second one? second one is the expected one. So T2 is not signed. The expect is not signed. It means unsigned. Then let's do this. It's already getting a bit too combinatoric for my taste here. It's, it's just, <clears throat> templates are just the wrong way to implement generic programming. Meta programming would be much better because then it's just much simpler to sort this stuff out. Templates are just a very bad implementation of generic programming. So what do we do here? I mean, this is really bad. We shouldn't hit this case normally, so.
that's funny I never saw this here I never saw something like this running text what did I do differently now Google test add test why do I still have this here ah because that's the C make that's probably the that is probably okay I forgot some things here that is probably that test discovery that does not work now this is something we could also build into our framework if we want to have some test discovery I forgot the percent But at least it's compiling. <laughs> With templates, you're always lucky if it at least compiles. That's already such a big achievement. So it's probably calling that test discovery stuff. The test is running. One of them fails, actually. Which one fails? why do I not see it now uh, because it goes to standard error it's above this is something I also don't know what should I really put out okay remember it remember it allocated is not zero and we should actually turn that around that's funny so it's claiming that we are leaking some memory but it is not I don't see it printing the leaked memory which it should do Is this printing so extremely slow this is crazy um, oh now here it is printing testing symbol dictionary three okay that's actually true we really leak that right now I think that's absolutely right <laughs> I already like my test framework so much better than Google test I, I I even like this this message here. It's it's actually easier to read than what Google test prints, in my opinion. Okay, here we print the leak. Uh, this this is something we could actually color now. That would be fun. That would be really fun to color this stuff for the heap. Okay, I think that's that's a genuine that's a genuine test fail. It's not a problem of our framework. And it's actually something I think we can fix. So this is the one we are leaking.
memory free typed what else does it take Okay, it takes really the, the type. Does it really need the type? It could take it from the point, all right? I mean, for this we need it, but I mean, as soon as we have the variable, we would need to use type info here. So that's something I will not do this now. That's something I might do. That's completely unrelated to the test framework. Yeah, passing, we have converted the unit test and our template magic works. But, <clears throat> but now, now the crucial thing how does the generated code look like it has 33000 lines <clears throat> remember that i think the one generated by google test had almost 5 million lines so still reasonable string stuff here that is all fine that was also fine with google test <clears throat> then okay here we actually it already starts to happen but it's not so bad we have we have quite a lot of these check equal mark uh, templates being instantiated Okay, actually also for pointers already. Already for pointers, we, we need to implement that. <clears throat> but okay, there are not that many of them. Maybe 30 or so, that's not too bad. And so let's look at a <clears throat> typical test one of the smaller ones uh, let's look yeah let's why not take this iso example 728 and test registrar blah 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 I think the test member function is what we <clears throat> what we actually want to look at this is where the stuff is happening so what is all this stuff this i need to understand one time what what all of this data is So, okay, that's brutal that this is really generated like this. Yeah, but then, you know. So, the expect falls should be very, very compact. That should be just a test and yeah. 
and the print basically if it fails and nothing else so very very small so true these are all okay and here we have one of the okay so it's not inlined but this is all very reasonable code size That's nonsense. It's first zeroing EAX and then it's checking it. Yeah, that's it's completely unoptimized code. I'm not sure what this is about. Yeah, no idea. Okay, so it's calling it's calling this check equal. unsigned int int and let's take a look at that check equal unsigned int int so this is used many times that is nice so it's always the same one that is important how often is this stuff called that <laughs> we really yeah i mean we have many test searches in there ah there it is so usual frame setup and poisoning of the stack then yeah, very nice compact comparison. That's fine. Okay, we have some, yeah, it's completely unoptimized, of course. So it does generate some some stupid code. But this is, I mean, it's still very small code. And as it is not inlined, it's also only once there. So it doesn't bloat things. Okay, this is just the printf. Yeah, the printf, of course, now we have all the, print, all the printfs in because it's not optimized. But it's only once because it's not inlined because it's not optimized. So that's not a big problem. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's not the most compact code. It has some useless stuff in there, but it exists only once and that's not so bad. That's not so bad. I mean, still we, I mean, we get 30 of them and we would we would maybe need more like i don't know how many would we would we need we definitely need two so one for unsigned one for signed integers We could cast we could cast all the we could cast the enums and so on. I mean I can always use the type macros when I want more compact code, so I could make a habit of using the type macros when I know the type. But this I mean this is much, much, much more reasonable than what is generated by Google Test. 33,000 lines compared with 5 million lines. That is a huge difference. Yeah, so I'm not too happy about some of the useless code. Let's see how a, a release build with debug info would look like.
this is amazingly slow this compiler detection this is something uh, so sooner or later i think i will scrap cmake too because this is just but i'm not so sure about that Okay, everything passed, and now let's look at at the profile version. Okay, it's smaller, so 20k lines as opposed to 30k lines. And let's see how this ISO stuff Uh, we want the test member function, right? Test member function, this is the one we want. Yeah, this is of course now very nicely optimized. It's a direct comparison with the constant. And then, so if it's equal, it jumps over. So it's not equal, what do we have here? Yeah, we directly have to print. So all the type related checks have been optimized away as you would expect. And yeah, we only call the printf. So everything has been inlined except the printf of course. And very compact yeah very nice actually it's just so the whole test is literally just this and it's just mostly the the printing that we would have anyway so even without templates so that's actually quite where does it go here that's actually quite reasonable 53 lines per test yeah and a lot of it are these comments and so on. And uh, well, yeah, I can live with that. So that's actually quite nice. I mean, one thing that would be interesting is to compare the compile times between the test file now and the test file that we would convert, that we would convert to use typed macros that don't do not need template mark magic but you see i can write template magic too if i want it's not pretty elegant boost style template magic but it's it does the job and does not blow up the code horribly even though it already shows some beginnings of combinatoric explosion and we will need a bit more we will need the pointers and so on but i won't do that today what I might want to do today is to try to convert a, a further test file because I now hate Google Test so much that I want to get rid of it everywhere. But this, that the feature works, that is very nice, very, very nice. So this is, which file was that? Test PDF parts are one of my most important tests. So let's actually go back to debug. I mean, compile times are still slow. Okay, we don't have string EQ, but that's a nice one. That, 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 that is something we can definitely implement immediately with a non-template macro.
Stringy coo. We don't need format for that. We know the format for strings, right? Don't we? And also we know that for strings we need to use string compare. And that means we need C string here. If string compare of actual and expected, which we should definitely put in. Yeah, this is some, I, I made some mistakes here. This should actually be like this. Uh, actual should be more careful here about my macro skills. String equal. So if string compare is not zero, of course, we could do some, some much nicer string printing with non-printable characters nicely formatted and so on. This is all stuff that we can do at later, at a later point in time. Also stuff that Google test does not do. So it's not something we lost now. Could this already work? Okay, min, that is because we are missing an algorithm here that we had previously, it seems we had this somewhere. Oh, it's already converted. See how quickly we can, we can convert a Google test test to our new framework. I'm actually thinking as the, the syntax is now so similar, we can so quickly convert the test. Maybe I should make the syntax completely, uh, completely the same, consistent with Google test and offer this as a library for people who want to get away from Google test for the same reasons. For sure, I would have to invest more work if I wanted to turn it into a really nice library. That is That is clear. What we still need to do is the, the logging of the seed and the seed forcing. This is something that I previously implemented for Google test and now it is of course lost for now. Let's see if we can also convert the fast test. Maybe it works right away. Test discovery is another thing, but I don't know if it's really important because I mean, I, 
in the long term I won't be using the test explorer of Visual Studio I think that's I will be working on the command line yeah this is now called test main Okay, we have again, this, this is the problem with the, with the test, um, with the test discovery, because it's trying to execute the test discovery and the test discovery doesn't work. I mean, it's probably not, not difficult to implement because test discovery just means, I think basically it prints a list of the registered tests, which with our little framework we can easily do. Let's just execute it directly and see if it works. This was JBIG2 fuss. This takes a bit, this, this test, because it runs many, 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 many in instances with random data. So we get the, se the, the seed locked here, but we will not yet get the logging on error. This is something I need to implement. But this is, I'm quite happy how, how fast we could convert a non-trivial test like the JBIG2 test, which is, I mean, it's about 1000 lines, I think 1100 lines of straightforward unit testing or integration testing actually mostly it's it's small scale integration testing and how quickly we could convert that from google test to our framework very nice yeah this is something i mean let's look at the google test documentation This is something that's always annoying that uh, you see that's what the people are doing rename test case to test suite instead of taking care of the crappy code they generate. So, okay, here it is not documented which value. Actually, okay, here they actually write actually expected, like I like to write it also. But I also, somewhere I also read the other order. Historical note, before I had a convention of calling it as expected. <laughs> okay, so lots of existing code uses this order. No, it is both matters in the same way. Yeah, okay, so they had this convention. And now they actually write it here like I prefer. So we can actually go mostly this way as long as we treat them equally enough. Yeah, that would be fun. Maybe I can turn my little framework into a tiny Google test replacement with of course not with this full feature set because I mean 
pull test, they let's see which features they emphasize. Um, for sure, all the integration features with the test discovery, yeah, that's not the big problem. Rich set of assertions, that's a nice thing, but we are also not that bad in that way. I mean, Google test is still much better in that. Um, death test, that's a complicated thing that maybe at one point we will want to do. Yeah, that's always a nice feature. This is something we also have now. So, I mean, it, it, it has its nice features. That's no question. These parama parameters tests, yeah, I'm not so sure about <laughs> XML test report generation, we don't need that. And it would be trivial to do if we wanted to. Yeah, so. Yeah, that would be fun <laughs> to make a little placement. We have a fail because we are leaking. No, this was the old, this was the old stuff. We have a pass and nice fast test. Pass, which collected all kinds of error messages, but that's expected in a fast test. Nice. Okay, it's late enough for today. I think it was a complete success today. Actually, maybe, maybe let's complete this and completely throw out Google tests so I can claim that I did it in, at least in two days that I did not fully work. <laughs> So that's the pro JV2 profile, right? Yeah. Okay, we need C assert here. Yeah, that's again, okay, I ch actually just want to build it. That's again the test discovery problem. We will deal with that another time. Test JV2 profile. This is also a long running test, which actually should be not, not executed in debug build because it doesn't really make sense to do it in debug. But we could compile it. So uh, let's see. Let's actually run some bear grab. I'm trying a tool I'm trying out. No completion. Yeah. 
Okay, from test U drill, it's already gone. And then you have the crap here, the, the VF art, blah, blah, blah. So not much left of Google test. To try it will be in the next we do. And that's probably already enough to convert it. Nice. We can even execute it here, probably. Yeah, the try it, the try it has a lot of out, lot of useless output, and it's not useless output. It's actually it, it parses some real PDF files and and does an ASCII display of some images in them. Okay, this is passed. Very nice. Very nice. Test timing is another feature that I want to add. So we, we of course have something, have some missing features, but that is nice. And what was the next thing? Test try it, yeah, that is also test try it. This is meant for piping to a log file. Actually, in this case, if we pipe only the standard out, we could still color the standard error. Okay, we have an exception failure here, but this looks very much like a real, like a real test fail that we have. So this is What did I do wrong here? So we just have to test discovery. Micro branch and this test U2. Yeah, here we have some leftovers, but we still need some some of that code that we will build in our framework. So not much left. G test, discover test. Yeah, the next thing is to throw the thing out of the C, C make lists. Bye bye Google test. No more. No more. Test discovery, no more. This is maybe something we want to have again, then this add test stuff. I don't know if it will work, but. So. Nice, so this should now also be gone. Can I refresh somehow? Test micro bench is the last one. It's so nice to remove this stuff.
<clears throat> I'm so happy about this new framework. And that is actually something that is not to be not to be dismissed or not to be underestimated is how great this is if you if you just enjoy working on your code base because partly also because you're proud of it because you build it yourself and but also because you do not have to deal all the time with problems introduced by other people so we had an abort yeah i think that's an actual test failure this out of memory that actually happens in this benchmark so we still have a lot in the dot vs i don't know exactly how this vs is regenerated <coughs> when when this is regenerated no idea but let's clean the project let's see if everything builds can no longer use the test explorer i don't know if i will be motivated to make this work again or if this is complicated to do a test adapter i don't know I will not invest real work into that. More important will be to make compiling faster by avoiding redundant recompiles because currently we have we compile many CPP files for all the executables, so we should stuff them in a static library or something. But definitely, definitely no more crazy compile times that take minutes and produce huge, huge amounts of code. So, okay, that test explorer does no longer work. So we will need to find another way to run the test. Um, something I wonder I wonder if there's something like ninja monolithic okay this is in CMake files probably Or is it called test? This is really so fast and doesn't do any output. I don't trust that. I do not trust that. But I'm too tired to check now. What is in testing? No idea. I don't know how this CMake test setup works. I never used that. <coughs> so let's run one of the tests finally to have something nice to look at test pdf parser nice and fast a 
Okay, that's it. So, um, do we still have a stream actually going on? Yeah, we even have some audio. <clears throat> okay, thanks for watching. Take care and see you. Bye.